This is the Thoughts from a Page podcast, which is now a member of the Evergreen Podcast Network. My name is Cindy Burnett, and each episode I interview authors about their latest works. For more book recommendations, check out my earlier episodes and my website, thoughtsfromapage.com. I recently posted my summer 2021 reading recommendations list, and it can be found on the blog tab on my website. Today, I want to highlight another book podcast that I have enjoyed listening to. If you enjoy this podcast, and I hope you do, you might also like the podcast Readers Digress. Have you ever made a New Year's resolution to read more nonfiction and then found yourself finishing every Ellen Hildebrand novel by June instead? Then this is the podcast for you. Hosts Katie Kiriaku and Molly Fox read nonfiction books so you don't have to, unless you want to. Join them every other Thursday as they review a new nonfiction book and discuss pop culture, politics, and everything in between. You can find them wherever you listen, including Apple and Google Podcasts, Stitcher, and Spotify. Today, I am interviewing Sarah Pinsker about We Are Satellites. Sarah is the author of over 50 works of short fiction, two novels, and one collection. Her work has won three Nebula Awards, the Philip K. Dick Award, and the Theater Sturgeon Award. I hope you enjoy our conversation. And now for a quick break. For the last year, I have been focusing more on my health and eating habits. In connection with that, I have started drinking AG1 in the morning. When I started drinking AG1 daily, I could feel a real difference in my health and energy levels. That is because AG1 is a foundational nutrition supplement that supports your body's universal needs like gut optimization, stress management, and immune support. Since 2010, AG1 has led the future of foundational nutrition, continuously refining their formula to create a smarter, better way to elevate your baseline health. I recommend AG1 to all of my family and friends because the company has a team of doctors and scientists. It is tested for 950 contaminants and is NSF certified for sport. It is formulated based on the latest science and it maintains high quality standards. Thanks AG1 for sponsoring my show. AG1 is a supplement I trust to provide the support my body needs daily. If you want to take ownership of your health, it starts with AG1. Try AG1 and get a free one year supply of vitamin D3K2 and five free AG1 travel packs with your first purchase. Go to drinkag1.com slash thoughts from a page. That's drinkag, the number one, dot com slash thoughts from a page. Check it out. And now back to my show. Welcome, Sarah. How are you today? I'm great. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Why don't we start out with talking about We Are Satellites? Why don't you just tell me a little bit about it? Sure. Uh, So this is a book about uh, one family and a new technology. It's one of those things that goes from being new and not too many people have it to everyone having it very quickly. And it's a brain implant that does a very specific little thing, which is just multitasking, basically. And uh, everyone starts getting it. And and it's a story of one family and who can get it and who can't and who wants it and who doesn't within that family. I was totally fascinated by this premise, and I'm dying to know how you came up with it. Uh, so so uh, about 10 years ago, I was working as sort of an information referral person and within the epilepsy field. And I was at a symposium that a doctor was giving, talking about new uh, technologies that were coming down the pike. And one of the things that she was talking about was an, a brain implant that that was supposed to work for epilepsy, and then it turned out not to. And instead, uh, they were going to use it for for another medical condition. And she kind of like wrote it off that way. And I was thinking about how frustrating it must be to watch one medication after another and one technology after another that would be developed to maybe help you mitigate your seizures. And then never mind, we're not going to use it for you after all, and it would move on. And then I added this layer where I started thinking of, well, I wonder what would happen if actually they couldn't find like a real therapeutic use, but suddenly they discovered that this would be a great thing, that that there was a commercial application for this, and how even more frustrating it would be when you can't even say, but at least people are being helped, and just to sit there and watch as everyone gets something that they're deliberately keeping you out of when it was developed for you. And it all sort of sprung from there. So I had this idea about Sophie, the daughter in the in the family first, and it, it sort of built out from there. Well, that's fascinating because I do feel like we're on the cusp of a variety of technological advances that maybe not exactly like this one, but where things, you know, it starts to become almost a moral issue. Like, is it okay to do this? Is that going to be truly altering our composition or the way we think or the way we do things? 
And so it's just a very fascinating premise. And it also bizarrely makes me think of Botox. And you know how they came up with Botox as like for helping with muscle pain. And then they're like, oh, but there's such another wonderful cosmetic application yeah. for it, you know? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and there, there are so many things where, you know, there, there's positions at, in, in a lot of these companies as, for ethics officers uh, whose job is sort of to, to voice those concerns. But there's still the question of how much will that person be listened to? When, when profit is on the line, you know, especially if you've put a lot of money into developing something, you know, how hard are you going to work at finding a way to use it, even if it's not the way you originally envisioned? Oh, absolutely. I mean, that's a decades old cautionary tale. Think about Teflon and some of the other things that are developed. And then they know that that Teflon is causing cancer, but they don't because they're making so much money, they don't want it to get out there. I mean, I think that that is definitely an issue that has been around for a long time and continues to be a problem. Yeah, I feel like there's certain questions that are, I think the questions often are the same, but the, you know, the specific application, the specific technology you're talking about differs sometimes. Oh, absolutely. And I mean, Teflon is just whether you're going to be using it to make your cooking a little easier versus, you know, like your your brain implant for sure. But it's just one of those things that you think, okay, that nobody's really learned from those cautionary tales and you can put an ethics officer in place or even an entire ethics committee, but it doesn't mean that that's necessarily going to help. Right. Well, what about research? Tell me about what you did in the way of research. Oh, there was, there was a lot of fun research for this one. Uh, I started with talking to neurologists and neuroscientists about where I could put this brain implant and what I could and couldn't realistically make it do. I like the limitations of making something that, that, could be almost plausible. I feel like with science fiction, you can take a little bit of liberty and, and you could take a lot and say, it's going to be Siri in your brain or whatever. But the bigger the bigger the leap, the more... I feel like I, I like to, to get close to something that could happen. And the doctors were saying, you can't do something big. It would have to be something small. Here's what a brain could theoretically do. And so, so I played with, with that until we came up with something that they, they agreed I could I could poke at and they wouldn't hate me for it. Well, and I just think the more you stay close to something that could actually happen, the more interesting and thought provoking the story is going to be. Yeah, especially if it's about the repercussions. If it's just going to be like, like like background on a on a starship, you know, like if it's a, if it's a, an implant that a character has on a starship in a far future story that's about something else, then you can you can do all kinds of things. But when you're actually talking about the repercussions of the technology, both good and bad, then it's nice to have those limitations that reality puts on it. And then I also could ask them, like, where should I put this in the brain? And it led me to the fact that I could actually put this neat little, cos- completely cosmetic little blue light in in people's heads that, that would um, sort of be an advertising for the company. And then I could play with the like the image. What I kept thinking about was the the old the first iPod ads, the ones with the those silhouettes, and then there would be a white like pair of headphones. And I remembered the ads, but I also remember just like you would see someone with a white pair of headphones, and you would say, "Oh, they have an iPod," uh, you know. And, and so I wanted that built-in advertising that would that would start making people see this this device. And then I also looked into because we're talking about a device instead of a medication, the pathway for devices to get to the market and what they have to go through, which was a real eye opener, because it turns out that like it's the Wild West compared to the way the medications get passed through. And we, we've all learned a, a whole lot more about that with vaccinations, like like how, how rigorous the testing really is. But the technology, like the different devices, like there is actually a whole lot that they can do that you would be shocked about. And horrified, right? <laughs> shocked and horrified. Well, tell me about the format. So how did you decide to write from multiple points of view? A lot of what I do as I'm developing a concept like this is I ask the questions, who would this hurt? Who would this help? Who would profit from this? Um, and I start making lists, like basic sort of vague shapes of, of who would fall into those categories. And I realized as I did that for this book that there were usually some of those people end up being side characters. And I like having side characters who are also invested, like they, because everyone has some reaction to this. It, it seemed like it would be a lot of fun to explore the dynamics between people, not just 
individuals as they dealt with it, but how the dynamics in a family would change when there was this big thing that was coming between them and changing their dynamics. And it, it just it just naturally evolved into a family book. I think even though I had the idea from the daughter Sophie's point of view, my first draft was from from the point of view of Val, who was one of the moms. And then I Sophie started asserting herself and tried to make it her story. And then they, they sort of everyone sort of wrestled about it. And and the only one who wasn't telling his story was David. And it took me a long time to realize I needed his perspective. And once I had that, that was actually the key to unlocking the book. And I needed all four of them to tell the story because it's not the story of any one of them. And, and there's there's no one hero here. Well, in multiple points of view are always so fascinating to me because you can disseminate information from each individual and the reader knows the information, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the other characters know the information. And yeah, I just think absolutely. it's a fascinating way to tell a story. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's fun to play with all of that, that you can, you can kind of see around more corners. Exactly. And kind of bring the reader into the story, almost make them more invested because they're knowing stuff and waiting to see when some of the other characters are also going to learn it. Yeah. And, and, and also to sort of force the question of, you know, like, which Spice Girl are you? Like, you know? Um, right. That's true, too. Yeah. yeah. That's a good point. I hadn't even thought about it that way. Like, who are you going to bond with or feel the most comfortable with? Yeah. Or who's, whose side would you, you who, take? Whose side would you take? Or, or even, like, which, which approach would you have to this technology? Right. Would you get it implanted or not? Right. Well, that actually leads me right into my next question, which was, which character did you enjoy writing the most and which did you enjoy writing the least? Um... I don't know that there is a least. I'm going to cheat and say that. But but Sophie was fun because she had so much personality and just was so aggressive in her atten- intentions. And David, like I said, I resisted writing David for a long time because I didn't think I could actually, I didn't think there was a way to do it. And the the way that he thinks, I thought it would be better left unsaid. And then I tried it, and he actually turned out to be so much fun to write. So in terms of actual, like, who was the most fun to write? Writing David was this weird physical experience where I, like, I, I had to be standing up and like leaning over the computer and a little over caffeinated. <laughs> yeah, it, it, I don't usually think about writing as as quite so physical a, a thing, but but writing him was physical. And that's funny, too, that it was the one you really didn't want to write. And in the end, you really enjoyed writing him. Yeah, absolutely. It was a it was a total surprise. And I'm so glad I, I took it on. Oh, that's great. What was the highlight of writing We Are Satellites? Oh, that is an excellent question. Maybe the answer to that is actually picking it up again, because this was a book that I had actually started and then put aside for for a few years because I couldn't I, I was I was stuck in a middle, which is not the middle that you see here, but I was, I had sort of ridden myself into a corner and I I knew that there was something that I couldn't do yet that I hadn't leveled up as a writer to be able to do. And I put it aside. It wasn't the same, like writers talk about trunking a book when you like put, hide it in the, in the trunk forever so that you don't, you know, like you abandon it and you don't look at it. And this wasn't a book that I was trunking, but I was sort of investing in the future me and when I finally pulled it out again and started writing it and realized that I, I did now have the, the skills that I wanted and I had developed the ideas and I was ready to take on those characters again. So it isn't a specific moment necessarily, but it's, it was that act of picking it up again and realizing that I had more story, that I finally did have more story to tell. I like that. So it wasn't that you thought, okay, this book isn't what I want it to be. It's just, it's not what I want it to be yet. So put it aside, give it some time. And, you know, I also think when you give things time like that, other ideas will come to you. So not only maturity or developing as a writer or, you know, whatever you kind of felt you gained in between, but it's also just putting it aside and letting your brain sort of subconsciously work on it. Yeah. And, and I've, I found with a lot of projects in recent years that if I put something aside and it keeps coming back to the top of my brain, that usually means, you know, that, I, that I'm getting ready to start working on it again. If I'm patient with an idea, then, then if it's worth working on, it'll, it'll start asserting itself again. I always find if I put something aside for a little while, even if I feel like I've done a good job with it and give it some time and come back to it, I always end up editing a fair amount 
changing different perspectives, whatever it is, I feel like, oh, I was so knee deep in it while I was working on it that I couldn't really see there was a problem here or that this part could be better, different things like that. Yeah. And there's always like, if you have the time between finishing a book and, and turning it in, like it is great to let it rest a little bit before you look at it again, because you probably will see things you want to change. Like I usually find myself thinking about little things that I want to run back and fix. And if you've written right up to the deadline, then you sort of have to let it go and hope that it's, you'll be able to fix it and edit. Yeah. When it comes back to you, make some small changes. Yeah. What about the title? How did you come up with the title for this one? It sort of always had this title. Like I, like I just had this image of these family members sort of trying to connect and, and, you know, they're, they're all sort of in their own orbits and it, it, it sort of always stuck, even though it wasn't necessarily literal. I just liked it. There was actually uh, someone came out with a book last year. That I think it's a self-published book, but there is a bo- another We Are Satellites that came out after this one was chosen and the title had gone to print and everything. And it's not a it's not a novel, but yeah. So I guess the title appealed to other people too. Just kind of that they're all revolving around each other. Yeah. What about the cover? Authors don't always get a lot of say in the cover, but this is actually, I adore this cover. I threw a few ideas that I had out there and I said, sort of, like, I, I'm not a big fan of very representative covers. I don't often like seeing the characters on a cover, but these are silhouettes and I have no problem with silhouettes. And I'm not even sure they're that representative because there's this little child on the cover, but the kids in the book are never actually that young in the time that we see them. But it, it feels to me like it's got this energy to it. Like, the, you know, there's an urgency to the way the two figures are holding each other. I love the colors. I love the sky that's above them. It reminds me a little bit of a Magritte painting that I love. Uh, the What's it called? The Empire of the Night, I think. That has like this dark street and then a very blue sky above. And it reminds me a little of Black Mirror. Yeah, I, I totally love the cover. Is that Magritte painting the one that hangs at the Peggy Guggenheim? Uh, I think it is. I love that painting. I actually have the poster of it and it hung in like my college dorm and then it now (laughs) hangs in our workout room just because that happens to be where it is. But I I love all of his paintings, but that's one of my favorites. I had it in my dorm room too, actually. Oh, that's so funny. Well, now I will always associate your cover with that. Well, what about working on anything else? Are you working on anything at the present or are you just really happy to be getting We Are Satellites out into the world? Uh, yeah, I'm writing again. I, I actually had taken a break during this past year after I turned this in. I wrote a couple of stories, but I, I I was having a little bit of trouble writing for a while. And then I came back to stories, but I couldn't write near future. And I'm actually still on, still on my uh, near future slump, but I'm a good way into a new novel that isn't near future. It's kind of historical, kind of fantastical, kind of contemporary, and it involved a lot of research, and I love research. So, so whenever, so actually, it comes back to what we were talking about because I, whenever I put it down, like I'm still thinking about it, even even if I have to, like I've I've been working on student stuff a lot for the last few weeks, and I haven't come back to it, but I am constantly having ideas for it and itching to get back to it. And so I can feel that it's, it's like well cooked. It's ready to go. It's an idea that you're excited to work on. Yeah. I always take that as a sign of a good book as a reader when I have to put it down to, you know, do stuff with my kids or cook or whatever it is, you know, go run errands. And then I'm just constantly, the book is kind of calling me back. Mm-hmm. I always take that as a sign of a very good book. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, as a, as a writer, that's what we want to hear. Well, before we wrap up, I would love to hear what you've read recently that you really liked. Uh, I've been re- I've been reading nothing but student stories, um, but <laughs> I am very excited to dive into. Well, there's a whole bunch of cool stuff that came out today that I'm very excited about reading. There's a new Zen Show novel. There's a new um, P. Jelly Clark novel. Brenda Peinado's collection that came out today. I think it's called The Rock Eaters, which I need to get my hands on. And then there are a whole bunch of really cool novellas that I have read recently. These novellas were my speed while I was reading student stuff. Alex Harrow's A Spindle Splintered, which is a fairy tale retelling. Becky Chambers' A Psalm for the Well-Built. I think I keep messing up the title, but it's it's a new series for her. Yeah, there's all kinds of cool stuff coming out right now. 
Brenda just contacted me because I'm in Houston and she is in Houston. And I don't know how long she's been in Houston. She just got there. Okay. That's what the impression I got based on her message. And I write a couple book columns for a big Houston magazine. And so she had reached out to me and her stories sound great. She's having oh, them sent to me and I can't wait to read yeah, them. Yeah, I'm super excited about that book. Everything that I've, I've heard about it sounds fantastic. Well, good. Well, that's great. This is literally that she just messaged me like three days ago. So it was good timing. Yeah, excellent. Well, Sarah, thank you so much for joining me on the Thoughts from a Page podcast. I'm really glad we got to talk about We Are Satellites. My pleasure. Thank you for the great questions. Thank you so much for listening to my podcast. If you like this episode, and I hope you did, please follow me on Instagram at Thoughts From A Page. Tell all of your friends about the podcast and rate it or subscribe to it wherever you listen to your podcasts. Sarah's book can be purchased at the Conversations From A Page bookshop storefront, and the link is in the show notes. I hope you'll check out Readers Digress, and I hope you'll tune in here next time. You might be surprised to know that not all serial killers are straight, cisgender white men, and the victims of true crime are not a monolith either. She's Wendy and I'm Beth, and together we host Fruit Loops Serial Killers of Color, a true crime podcast. Together we take deep dives into the true crime stories about marginalized and minoritized perps and victims that often go untold. We also provide the context and nuance that these stories deserve. At Fruit Loops, we're serving up true crime with a side of history, society, culture, and some fun. Listen to Fruit Loop Serial Killers of Color on Spotify, Google Play, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts.